Good evening and welcome to this uh, second Nobel Prize uh, lecture of this festival. Joe Stiglitz doesn't need any introduction, not only because he has been uh, to previous edition of the festival, he was with us uh, in 2015, and that time he was in presence, and we hope to have him back soon with us in Trento. Uh, but also because uh, Joe Stiglitz is one of the most influential economists in the world. Um, according to some uh, rankings made by the Syllabus Project, is among the five economists most widely cited in the discipline, eh, in the profession, uh, together with uh, Daron Asemoglu, who was just uh, presenting uh, here uh, in uh, Trento, and just before uh, Esther Duflo and uh, other uh, person we know very well in, in Trento because of their contribution to previous edition of the, of, of, of the festival. Um, but also is ex very well known also outside the profession. I think if you were to ask uh, um, uh, the layman, the person, the lay person about uh, famous economists, I think that the name of Joe Stiglitz would be one of the first uh, uh, to be recalled. Um, Joe Stiglitz has been uh, uh, working uh, uh, very much in uh, understanding uh, market failures. Uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. We were talking about this uh, in 2015 because of his work on uh, uh, informational asymmetries. Uh, clearly, this is a typical case where uh, the uh, private initiative, uh, the market, fails and there is a need for state intervention. But there are many other, clearly, cases where this is needed. Um, and uh, also he has been uh, uh, very important in uh, looking at uh, the nature of policy making and uh, also in inspiring policy making, having very important position. Uh, first of all, he was uh, uh, the, the president of the Council of Economic Advisors under the Clinton administration. He was also senior vice president of the, of the World Bank and the chief economist. And that is very well known for his independent thinking. Uh, in some areas, he has been really a pioneering evolution of the way of thinking of economists. Uh, on, uh, in presenting the limitation of globalization, he was traveling with some 20, 25 years in advance with many other people in the, in the profession. So uh, tonight, is going to talk about uh, the return of a state, which is also the title of this edition of the festival, so it's perfectly uh, on topic and uh, the end of neoliberalism. So, uh, Joe, the floor is yours. And thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you. And I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person. Uh, I really enjoyed my, my uh, time last time in, in Trento. Uh, this is a, a, a moment of, of uh, real reflection because it's, to me at least, it's clear that uh, the neoliberal model that uh, has prevailed for the last four decades uh, has come to an end. Uh, even in the United States, uh, the country uh, most devoted to neoliberalism, you might say, both the left and the right, both the Democratic and the Republican parties have rejected neoliberalism. Uh, different grounds, different bases, but uh, uh, you might say uh, neoliberalism uh, has fallen from the dominant position that it had uh, uh, before the 2008 crisis. My talk today is about where we should be going in this post-neoliberal uh, order. But to understand where we should be going in this post-neoliberal order, one has to understand um, uh, the failure of markets. Um, uh, markets governed by profit-making uh, um, private firms. We have to understand better the role of government. And we have to understand why the dichotomy often presented between private and public uh, is too simplistic and that we ought to be looking for a richer, what I would call ecology of institutional arrangements. So I'm going to begin the discussion about, uh, with the critique of markets. 
Uh, that's central because neoliberalism put Marx on a pedestal. It basically said, rely more or less on Marx with a very small role for government to fill certain limited uh, problems. And I want to argue that both theory and evidence shows that markets on their own are neither efficient nor stable. They produce uh, too little of some things, uh, too little research, uh, and too much of other things, uh, too much pollution, um, too much risky investments of the kind that led to the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, the externalities that we've repeatedly confronted uh, are areas where markets are very important. And today we realize that externalities are not a second order phenomena, they are first order. Climate change is existential. Uh, the future of the planet is at risk. And climate change is the result of an externality. The fact that each individual, and as he goes about his business, produces uh, too much carbon, uh, too much carbon dioxide, methane, all the other greenhouse gases, and that has put the planet at risk. Uh, they, externalities were at the center of the pandemic. Uh, one individual's decision not to wear a mask and I'm pleased to see that most of you are wearing masks uh, or not to get vaccinated, puts others at risk. And so uh, you need a government uh, intervention. Now, just as an aside, one of the uh, problems of leaving this uh, to the market, leaving it to individuals, has been in the United States, a lot of people are saying, uh, you're infringing on my freedom to require me to wear a mask or require me to get a vaccine. But one person's freedom is another person's unfreedom. Your decision not to wear a mask imperils the lives of others. So a slight inconvenience to you can lead to a situation where you put at risk the life of somebody else. And that's why society as a whole has to make judgments of how do you balance these. And it's clear in this particular case that the slight inconvenience of a mask is totally outweighed by the risk of public health, the risk of death, the risk of disease to the rest of society. And that's why, correctly in my view, governments have mandated masks, and it's why I think governments should mandate vaccines. Um, and in many areas, they have. Uh, so uh, these externalities are at the center of our society. In 2008, the world saw a major economic top downturn. Again, it was caused by externalities. It was caused by the fact that our banks undertook excessive risk. And when those risks didn't pay off, the entire global financial system experienced a meltdown, jobs were lost, and uh, there was an enormous amount of economic suffering. And that's why we need regulations to prevent that kind of excess risk taking, to make sure that banks have adequate balance sheets. Right now, there's another uh, uh, example of a uh, go, uh, debate going on, again, involving the banks. The banks want to continue to lend to fossil fuel. They want to continue to provide capital that will put at risk the entire planet. Financial risk was one thing, but now we're talking about planetary environmental risk. And they don't want to be circumscribed from engaging in this extraordinarily risky lending, 
risky for the financial market because when the re- reality uh, 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 comes in, prices of carbon reflect that reality. The value of the carbon assets will go down. There'll be stranded assets. There'll be a, a risk, at least of a significant risk of a financial crisis. And they're resisting the central banks engaging in the kind of regulations that would prevent this kind of disaster. Um, So uh, these are all examples of uh, externalities that are front and center. They're not second order things. Uh, If you took a standard economics course, you might discuss the externalities in one small chapter, often at the end of the course, you may not have had time to do it. Uh, The point I want to emphasize, these are first order effects. But there's another set of problems with markets. Markets pay no attention to social justice, the distribution of income. Um, And uh, that uh, is explicit in the multiple uh, power grabs uh, that uh, private profit maximizing firms are engaged in. Uh, there are two ways of uh, getting rich. One is by contributing to social welfare, by making innovation, innovation uh, by working hard. But there's another way of getting rich, and that is by exploiting others, Uh, exploiting market power, exploiting human vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, too many of those who become very rich have done it through the latter, through exploitation in one form or another, rather than through social contributions. Uh, this, there are two alternative theories that have co- competed with each other for a very long time. One says, views the economic uh, relations as basically harmonious and inequalities as basically arising from differences in individuals' social contributions. The other view views things as much more contentious, much more conflict, much more uh, a matter of power and power leading to some groups exploiting others. In recent years, the evidence has become overwhelming that the second view provides a better description of what is going on in today's economy, in today's society. If you look at where the, 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 the enormous inequalities that have grown, for instance, in the United States, a very large fraction of those at the top, not all, have gained a very large fraction of their wealth through exercise of market power uh, and uh, uh, abuse, uh, exploitation of others. Uh, in a way, uh, the president of the United States before Biden uh, was emblematic of this kind of exploitation. Trump University excelled, like many of the other uh, for-profit universities, excelled in uh, trying to figure out how to take advantage of other individuals and fighting against regulations that would circumscribe their ability to take advantage of others. Uh, We've seen a a recent battle uh, in the United States uh, over these power relationships. Let me just give you a couple uh, examples. And these have to do with the rules of the economic game. The rules of the economic game are not just incidentals. They really define uh, how things play out. So one important area is the rules that allow workers to get together, collect a bargaining, unionize. Do they facilitate workers coming together and and, uh, 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 bargaining together? 
or do they hamper it? And the, the, the employers for the last 40 years have been engaged in a strategy of weakening the bargaining rights of workers, making it more difficult for them to unionize. It's a matter, you might say, of increasing transaction costs. That makes it sound innocuous. But outcomes can really be affected by these kinds of transaction costs. The question is, are Uber workers employees or are they self-employed? You might say, what difference does it make? Well, it turns out it makes a great deal of difference. Because if they're employees, we pass laws that help protect them against exploitation. But Uber and the other platforms don't want that kind of protection. They know that that protection changes the balance of power and helps workers so that they can get a barely decent standard of living, that they get paid at least a minimum wage. And that's why Uber has fought uh, hard to make sure that they're treated as self-employed so they aren't given these kinds of protections. Another example, something that should be obvious that those advising investors, old age people, thinking people who are investing for their old age, retirement accounts, should be held to a fiduciary standard. In other words, they're acting on behalf of those that they're supposed to be advising. There shouldn't be conflicts of interest. But when the Obama administration passed a regulation that said that investor advisors should not have conflicts of interest and should be held to a fiduciary standard, the investment community, the banks, the other investment community rose up in arms and said, we can't operate if we don't exploit those who are putting their funds with us. We have to have conflicts of interest to take advantage of them. Well, you can see I get a little bit worked up about this because I think it's outrageous that somebody that you go to trusting them can have those conflicts of interest and not even disclose them. Well, these are the rules of the game. Right now, we've been going through another example in the context of climate change. As all of you know, the big corporations are make decisions by boards of directors. The boards of directors are elected by the shareholders. And in the United States, there have been advisory services that have advised the shareholders how to vote. They advise them about, for instance, the environmental position of boards of members of the boards of directors in oil companies like Exxon. Well, if you're the president and CEO of Exxon, or if you're uh, the leader of one of these oil companies, uh, you don't want that. You want to appoint your friends to be on the board of directors. And so you don't want these advisory services telling uh, the public who, which directors are good for the environment and which directors are bad. And so under the Trump administration, they passed a regulation circumscribing these advisory services. Well, as many of you may know, in spite of that, there was a contested election to the board of directors of Exxon, and uh, the uh, old board, th three of the old board of directors were replaced by uh, a new slate that uh, seems to be more committed to dealing uh, with the environment. Uh, absolutely necessary to save the planet and also for the future profits because uh, like it or not, uh, those investments they're making in oil are going to be stranded assets in the not too distant future. Well, uh, the uh, 
Uh, the good news is that the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is charged with protecting ordinary investors, the newly appointed uh, head, Gary Gensler, has announced that he's not going to enforce this uh, uh, despicable regulation from the Trump administration and uh, will revisit uh, the regulation. And it wasn't even clear whether it was uh, legally enforceable. Well, globally, we also see uh, uh, power being exercised in a whole variety of ways. Uh, power was exercised uh, in colonialism. Um, the uh, more generally, we recognize uh, we, we should recognize uh, that the idea that markets are competitive, at least sufficiently competitive, that the standard neoliberal model is applicable. Uh, that is a myth. Um, there is some competition, but not sufficient to curb the exploitations, the market power that I've described. And that's precisely why this has become such a political battle. The third issue I want to talk about is why government the role of government is particularly important in the 21st century. Uh, the model, neoliberal model, never made any sense. Uh, my own work showing that markets on their own are not efficient, uh, work showing it's not stable, uh, should have uh, made it clear that there was an important role for government intervention to deal with externalities, public goods, uh, problems of social justice. But in the 21st century, the role of government is likely to be even more important. And that's because we're moving into the knowledge-based economy. And knowledge is what economists refer to as a public good. We mean it in a technical sense that the marginal cost of production, of, of disseminating the good to another person uh, is zero. Uh, if I know something and I tell you, so, tell it to you, uh, you still know it. I, it hasn't subtracted uh, what I know. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, put it much more poetically than economists do uh, when he said, uh, knowledge is like a candle. When one candle likes another, it doesn't diminish from the light of the first candle. And because knowledge is a public good, if it's privately produced, it won't, there won't be enough production. And when it's privately produced, those who produce it try to hoard that knowledge to restrict the dissemination so they can benefit from the market, uh, from the, the market power that that knowledge uh, produces. And as knowledge, as we move more and more into knowledge economy, this becomes more and more important, becomes more and more important for uh, government to play an important role in the, in the production of knowledge. We've just seen that in the context of COVID-19. Why was it that we were able to produce vaccines, mRNA vaccines, so quickly? Well, because government had supported the basic research, DNA, mRNA, and it was at the University of Pennsylvania that they actually began the research that led to the RNA vaccines. So, yes, the private sector played a very important role in going the last mile, but that last mile was based on an enormous amount of publicly funded research. But in the case of the vaccines, of course, not only did the government provide the funding for the basic research, it also provided a vast amount of funding for the development of these vaccines and their production. Uh, so government uh, has a, a very important role in the knowledge economy. It is the reason why standards of living today are so much higher than they are were 200 and 250 years ago. It's because of advances in knowledge. And uh, that is really at the core of a modern economy and increasingly 
So we also need regulation as we live in closer quarters. We become a more urban society. We interact more. Uh, and those externalities, urban externalities, become so much more important. Climate change, which I've emphasized over and over again, is a quintessential example of an externality uh, problem that we didn't face 100 years ago to the center of our society, of our economy today. As inequalities have increased over the last 40 years, the issues of social justice have moved center. And again, they can't be addressed alone by the market economy. So all these things which are at the center of the problems that we face today, the climate crisis, the public health crisis, um, the structural transformation of our economy, the inequality crisis, all of these require uh, a larger role for government than it's had in the past, and a much larger role than that provided by the neoliberal vision of what a good society is like. So uh, that brings me to uh, perhaps the uh, one of the most important issues, which I'll come back to uh, in the end, um, and that is the nature of the economy helps shape the nature of our society. Uh, it's an issue that, that we as economists uh, uh, began to face when uh, we looked at what was happening in the 2008 financial crisis. How did the financial sector, the bankers, become so greedy, so selfish? A few years before they became bankers, they had been our students. And as students, they didn't seem that different. Uh, but the longer they stayed in the financial sector, the longer they focused on money, the greedier, the more materialistic, the more selfish they became. And that raises the fundament, an, another fundamental flaw in the conception of economics that's been dominant for uh, the last uh, 50 years or more. And that is that individuals enter life with well-defined preferences shaped by nature rather than shaped by their experiences and by society. But in fact, we know that as parents, we try, we work very hard to try to uh, affect what our children are going to be like. We want them to be honest. We want them to be compassionate. We want them to care for others, not to be selfish. So we work very hard at shaping our children. But we, as a society, have forgotten that the workplace is where we spend a very large fraction of our time. And how we organize that workplace affects who we are and what we value. If we spend a lot of time thinking just about material goods, maximizing profits, if that is the dominant thing that we think about, we become more selfish, we become more materialistic. But there are other ways of or other parts of our life and other ways of organizing production. Uh, around the world, in many countries, cooperatives have played a very important role. In the United States, the only part of our financial system that functioned well before, during, and after the financial crisis of 2008 were, were our cooperatives, called our credit unions. 
they didn't engage in the same kind of exploitation because the members of the credit union were the people who would have been exploited. They didn't engage in reckless risk-taking because that would have affected the members of the co-op, of the credit union. After the crisis, they continued lending to small and medium-sized businesses when the big banks withdrew their lending, uh, contributing to the magnitude of the economic downturn. In Italy, in certain parts of Italy, cooperatives have played a very important role. Produce, many of these are producer cooperatives. They're also uh, uh, consumer cooperatives. In Spain, uh, uh, one of the largest uh, enterprises is, is a cooperative. And it too has functioned well. So what I want to emphasize here is that we need to think about more broadly a broader range of social institutions, not just for-profit, profit-maximizing institutions. When I reflect on, on this in terms of the uh, United States, uh, I also think about uh, the fact that one of our most successful sex of institutions, one of the things that gives us our technological leadership are our universities. And none, none of our major universities or any significant university is a for-profit institution. Most of them are not-for-profit foundations. Some of them are state universities like University of California in Berkeley. But no one would think that a for-profit institution is a good way of organizing the production and dissemination of knowledge. In fact, <laughs> the example I gave before of Trump University is emblematic of what happens when you have a profit-making institution. Uh, it excels in one thing, figuring out how to exploit others. So um, the point is that I try to emphasize that as we move into the post-neoliberal world, we want to uh, think about a rich ecology of institutions, um, not just profit maxi maximizing institutions, not just uh, government at the central level, but government at a local level and regional levels, um, various forms of collective action, unions and, and uh, 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 people engaged in, in uh, collective um, uh, protection, uh, redress of uh, some litigation uh, when uh, there's been uh, harms done. Uh, we call uh, class action suits. Um, as we think about this broader range of institutions and the balance among them that we should be striving for, uh, as we construct this post-neoliberal economy and society, uh, the natural question that we want to ask is, what kind of society and what kind of people do we want to be? Uh, and that bring, brings us back to basically a fundamental question. Uh, what makes for a good society? What we know from neoliberalism is that it didn't make for a good society. It did just the opposite. While it pretended to model a harmonious society, it actually, it, uh, society would bring people together, it actually did just the opposite and created huge divides between various groups and engaged in uh, a whole variety of exploitations that I haven't had time to fully describe. Um, 
if what we've seen over the last recent uh, decade uh, years, uh, how the neoliberal uh, agenda unleashed um, an ugliness that is uh, hard to fathom, uh, as exemplified in the vaccine protectionism uh, and the uh, selfishness uh, that we've seen in the private sector's uh, reluctance uh, to grant uh, the waiver on the vaccine's uh, intellectual property at the WTO. So as we reflect on how the neoliberal order failed, failed not just economically, but failed in a way that was far deeper in reshaping our society in a way that I think many of us think uh, is not what we would have wanted, uh, would not want uh, our children to be the, uh, uh, reflect uh, the values that have been exemplified uh, by the bankers and uh, some of the drug companies uh, in recent years. So this is a real opportunity to reflect on uh, where we've been, why things didn't work out, and uh, where we want to go. It's an opportunity which I hope we seize. And I'm so pleased that you've had uh, this uh, opportunity to share these views with you uh, here in Trento. Thank you so much, really, for this uh, very well thought and uh, inspiring uh, lecture of yours, also for the way you uh, clarified and uh, the notion of externality, which is indeed uh, a crucial notion, um, but uh, I think uh, we, I mean, also have been learning very much also uh, during the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, uh, questions that uh, one would like to, to ask. Uh, let's see, before I, I, I do it myself, I wonder whether here in the room, which is the nice thing about this edition of the festival is that we do have, uh, again, uh, people in, in, uh, in the room, so we can take some questions from the floor. Here is already one question coming, so I think someone should uh, bring the microphone here. Okay. Buonasera. Thank you. Thank you, really. Uh, my name is Alberto Viano, I'm Managing Director of uh, Lease Plan in Italy, so a multinational company. And the question I pose you is, uh, is an amazing lesson, really. The point to us is how far a single government <clears throat> could go in put together rules and a minimum set of rules to encourage or, uh, or fight certain, certain misbehavior of, uh, of this last neo neoliberal uh, model uh, how far a single state could go uh, before the other one uh, take advantage of it. I mean, what we see actually is that if you try to do something, then the result is that you lose the companies. We used to say in Italy, we have our major local companies which have the headquarters in London, the headquarters in Amsterdam, the headquarters abroad, exactly because it's not that convenient to stay here. So the point is how or what idea we can share in order to, to be able to, to have a common eh, set of minimal rules of good rules for making healthy business. Thank you. That's an absolutely great question. And uh, it's, it's a, a question that, that uh, has been troubling an awful lot of people. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples where, where it's particularly troubling. There are some areas where, uh, fortunately, we're beginning to get what you described as a minimal set of rules. Uh, the Biden administration has, for instance, proposed a minimum corporate income tax. Uh, so you don't have Ireland or Luxembourg trying to uh, uh, have a race to the bottom to steal your firms uh, by uh, uh, advantaging uh, uh, the, the, the taxes. Um, the, uh, 
they proposed a 21 percent uh, 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 minimum uh, global corporate income tax. Um, for some reason, Europe has been reluctant, but I believe on Friday, uh, that's, uh, um, I guess that's tomorrow, uh, I am very hopeful that they will agree uh, to a uh, 15%, uh, better than the 12.5% that was on the table before, uh, and hopefully it will be a comprehensive. So that's one example of, of working globally towards achieving a, a minimum standard, as you say, a, a minimum standard of rules. And I think that's going to help a lot in curbing the kind of, of race to the bottom uh, that we uh, saw from Luxembourg and and and, and a lot of the uh, um, safe havens uh, around the world. Uh, an example uh, where uh, we are going to be confronting uh, this kind of where do we determine the basic rules is going to be an AI where uh, Europe, the United States and China have very different views on privacy of data and uh, data is the critical input to AI and uh, uh, China and the United States uh, have uh, very different views. U.S. worries about public uh, access to knowledge. Uh, Europe worries about large corporations having access to all our knowledge and using it as they have done uh, to exploit uh, uh, individuals. Um, we have both of these uh, are uh, created a surveillance state, one a private, one a public surveillance state, but it's still a surveillance state. And I happen to be much more sympathetic with uh, Europe's perspective, which is uh, not wanting to go to a surveillance state, either public or private. Um, but in the end, I think Europe standard of living, sense of well-being is going to depend on it saying we there's more than material well-being. We have to protect our citizens. And that may mean that those who've engaged in surveillance in their own country, giving them a competitive advantage, won't be allowed free access to Europe. So that's the kind of, of uh, it may be that one has to uh, engage in those cross-border regulations so that post-neoliberal era isn't going to have as free and easy go uh, goods going uh, across borders. Let me give an uh, even more uh, important example or more uh, present example, and that is environment. Uh, I think Europe is absolutely right to be advocating cross-border taxes for against those who produce goods uh, that are uh, uh, excessively uh, uh, endanger the planet uh, through uh, carbon emissions. Um, uh, it's necessary uh, uh, for them to do it. And it's totally consistent with uh, the WTO. So I think in the end, it's going to be what, what matters is the standards of living broadly defined. And when I say broadly defined, including our sense of security, our, our uh, environment. Uh, and uh, when you do that, it may be that uh, uh, there will be a sacrifice it, to some extent in uh, material standards of living. But what is really important is not the material standard of living, but overall standards of living. But to respond to your particular question about how do you manage this in a world of globalization, I think one has to uh, try to negotiate common standards. And when you can't achieve those common standards, when some country refuses to, like uh, America under Trump, refuses to have adequate uh, environmental standards, then you have to uh, impose uh, 
trade barriers. Joe, one thing that you said, uh, I think, uh, about uh, the, uh, the role of Europe and the position of Europe vis-a-vis -vis the proposal by the Biden administration to have this minimum uh, corporate uh, income tax, is that uh, Commissioner Gentiloni, the Commissioner for Economy, uh, um, said that the festival uh, we had this, uh, this morning, uh, but uh, in his view it is a, an important proposal and he thinks that... Uh, uh, things will move ahead in that respect. Uh, although there is one issue that is important, and notably what we are going to do with the proceeds of these uh, taxes. In other words, uh, uh, where also they should be collected. Um, uh, you know, the, the idea is that they should not be the headquarters of this uh, giant corporation to be the locus where these are taxes and the government, in a way, gets the proceed of these taxes, but should be where the profits are being made. Uh, would you agree on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this position? Very much so. Um, ascertaining where the profits are made uh, turns out to be a more complicated issue uh, because of what economists would call joint production. Uh, the the uh, production process involves uh, a platform that may, the, the research may have occurred in the United States. Data uh, that is used may come from all over the world. The sales may occur in another country. And uh, one has a, a difficult task in trying to allocate uh, where the profits originated. Uh, that's a problem that we faced in the United States a very, very long time. Uh, corporations uh, do business uh, across the states and uh, the, the uh, uh, it's very difficult. It, it, there's a challenge of how do you allocate where does the income originate? And uh, what I've been advocating is an approach which is called a formulaic approach, where you have a, a formula that looks at sales, uh, looks at production, uh, looks at employment, capital, and uh, on the basis of that allocates uh, the profits uh, um, to uh, uh, various jurisdictions. Now, the particular formula may differ from one industry to another. So in the case of the internet sales, obviously uh, where what they're doing is equivalent to what would be basically a retail store, sales may be a much more important fraction uh, than it would be in uh, uh, some other uh, case when you're making steel, where the production, is, it, it, the locus of production, is much more uh, important. So those are some of the subtleties and complexities. Let me just say for those who've been following the negotiations at the OECD on this matter, uh, this issue of the allocation of profits is called Pillar One. And the proposal at the OECD uh, is, is totally inadequate. Um, they are trying to allocate uh, uh, just a small fraction of the profits. Uh, it needs to be, all the profits has to be allocated. And there has to be a lot more subtlety uh, in, in how do you do this. Um, and uh, I think one of the good news is that the Biden administration seems much more willing to uh, open up uh, for discussion um, what was called digital taxation to make sure that the digital giants pay a fair share of taxes in the countries where they're raising advertising revenues, where they're making sales. Um, and and uh, that is absolutely essential. And finally, let me say uh, what I worry a great deal about as we rethink uh, where the money goes, make sure that the voice of developing countries and emerging markets are heard. Uh, the discussions are, are largely going on at the OECD, which is the, the club of the banks countries. And uh, there is some concern 
that uh, the, the developing countries and uh, emerging markets are going to come out short in those bargains. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I think there is another question from the floor now that we want to take. Uh, the microphone, you should go there, please. Yes, si si può farla in italiano. You can speak Italian. Buonasera. Nella fine del neoliberismo. Good evening. With the end of neoliberalism, we had a lot of populism as well. Inequalities led to the dissemination of populism both in the US and in Europe. Don't you think that that can be a vicious circle? How can we interrupt this vicious circle whereby, again, we trigger, in a way, populism? Uh, should we fight against inequalities, perhaps, to break this vicious circle? Yes, very much so. I, I think this is absolutely critical. And uh, what we've seen uh, as an example is what uh, President Biden has done uh, in his first 100 days, uh, his $1.9 trillion rescue package uh, designed to help the U.S. economy recover, and uh, it seems uh, to be working, but also was very concerned about inequality. And uh, the colleagues of mine at Columbia University estimate in one year, it will reduce childhood poverty in half from about 20% to 10%. Uh, that's an enormous achievement in one year. And of course, it has enormous long run economic benefits because if a child grows up with inadequate nutrition and poverty with inadequate health, uh, he's not gonna be uh, living up to his potential as a productive member of our society. So I view it as a long run uh, uh, growth strategy, but it's also uh, very important in breaking the cycle of inequality. An important uh, part of that is also uh, in the agenda in the United States, uh, which is uh, restoring progressive taxes. Uh, many of you may know that one of the things that happened in December 2017 is President Trump uh, passed uh, a tax bill which uh, will lead, when it's were to be fully implemented, would lead uh, a majority of those in the bottom to actually pay more taxes, but those at the top to pay less taxes. And uh, so much so that those at the very top will be paying less taxes than those as a percentage of their income than those below. In other words, a regressive uh, federal income tax system. Uh, Biden has proposed reversing this. Now, let me emphasize how contentious this is, because uh, obviously those at the top of who, who are enjoying that high income uh, are going to, and have the resources to affect politics, are going to use that money to affect that politics. And America, our democracy is tainted by money. Uh, we have a system that is more described by one dollar, one vote than one person, one vote. Uh, and they are now, uh, the Republican Party is now openly, openly engaged in a process of taking away, denying the right to vote to, uh, uh, or maybe may more accurately, making it more difficult for uh, ordinary working people, the poor, to vote. Um, and when they do vote, uh, engaging in gerrymandering to make sure that uh, their vote doesn't count as much. So American democracy is very much at risk. And that's why what happens in the next few years is going to be very, very critical. Uh, if we are able to uh, uh, address some of these problems of inequality, if we're able to reverse this cycle, we'll replace a vicious downward cycle of 
a greater inequality and uh, less democracy with more equality and a stronger democracy. We are going to talk about uh, fiscal fairness also in our discussion at this festival. Tomorrow evening, I'm saying this because it is not in the printed version of the program, but we are going to have a, a presentation of, of a book by Kenneth Sheev and uh, David Savestage on uh, taxing the rich and on uh, you know, fiscal fairness, especially after big events like wars and, and uh, a pandemic. Um, I think we are close to the end, so let me uh, play, if I may, a bit of a, of a devil uh, role, because I think it's needed sometimes also in this type of discussions. Uh, so I would say that you have been extremely effective in showing and documenting market failures from externalities, uh, uh, exploitation over exploitation of, of workers, uh, under provision of public goods uh, like uh, knowledge. Uh, but there are also government failures. Um, and we have been talking about government failures before in the uh, lecture by Michael Kramer. Kramer. For instance, these self-fulfilling shortages in the production of vaccines. So nationalist attitudes whereby government have been uh, uh, not uh, closing all the uh, export, banning export of vaccines and also sanitary and, and uh, help uh, to, to, to other countries. And that has created a situation where the pandemic has been going on. So even democratically elected governments sometimes uh, fail and uh, fail uh, not by a minor margin. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is also <laughs> an important issue to be, to be taken into account. Not, the public is not the monolith, and sometimes also the public sector may fail. Uh, I can, I, can I comment? Yes, please. So, anybody uh, who has lived in America for the last 20 years knows about government failure. We have President Bush, and we thought that was bad enough. And then we have President Trump. So we know uh, we can talk about government failure up and down uh, better than any other country, uh, uh, I think. So uh, yes, we are very aware of that. I emphasized in my talk having a rich ecology of institutions, a system of checks and balances. Uh, so that we aren't reliant on any one single set of institutions. But let me, I'm commenting on the government failure. Let me also emphasize that was not an accident. 40 years of neoliberalism, 40 years beginning with Reagan and Thatcher, 40 years of denigrating the role of government succeeded in weakening government. So if you, if you wage a war against an institution like government for 40 years, it's going to be a weaker institution. And we saw that, let me talk about it, the United States, we saw that in the case of the COVID-19. Uh, under Obama, uh, Obama set up, we saw SARS, we saw MERS, so we set up a White House office to respond to a pandemic. Uh, that's what governments are supposed to do. They're supposed to look into the future, see what are the risks, and try to manage them. And they created that within the National Security Council, recognizing that it was a risk to our security. And of course, no, nobody outside could have done as much damage to our economy as COVID-19, so it was a security issue. What did Trump do? He disbanded the, the White House office on pandemic. We had a very, very good institution to deal with infectious disease, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC. It trained people all over the world, created institutions all over the world to monitor and manage infectious disease. What did President Trump do? He defunded it. He defunded even that particular part of that which was concerned about diseases that originate in animals and jump to humans, which is what COVID-19 is. So it was a conscious attempt to destroy government and to weaken it, and he succeeded. 
And that's why government wasn't a capable. But uh, we all have to be aware that our institutions, you know, humans are fallible to, uh, as Shakespeare said, to, to, to err is to be human. Uh, all our human institutions are fallible. Uh, we have to recognize that. That's why we have to have systems of checks and balances. And that's why we have to have strong democracies to make sure that all of our institutions work. And so that's why what I'm calling for is this richer ecology, which recognizes the weaknesses in all of our institutions and hopefully working together these institutions can create not a perfect society. That's beyond our uh, should be beyond our ambition, but but a better society uh, and uh, certainly a better society than we've ha uh, had for the last forty years. Thank you, thank you so much, Joe. I think is a applause that if you can hear. Unfortunately, we also in, in this country, we have some uh, several examples of uh, government <laughs> failures. I know. Uh, uh, anyhow, so I'm sure there are many other questions from the floor and people uh, following us on live streaming uh, would have many questions, but unfortunately the time is, is over. But uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz will be again with us on Saturday at, uh, at 8 p.m. And uh, we very much look forward also to, to this. And uh, let me thank you again also and we know that, uh, that uh, you, uh, when you were here, you have been doing so many things, uh, following many other debates. So your presence here for us is, uh, is a wonderful memory. I also would like to remind that you were also uh, rewarding and, uh, um, the students who made the, the competition last time. And uh, so also this year we are going to do that. And uh, uh, you know, next time you, we hope to have you with us. So thank you again, Joe, for, for this wonderful lecture. And Thank you all for being with us.